So thank you very, very much, everybody, for joining us. And welcome to Bianca Kramer and Jureen Bosman from Utrecht University Libraries. We're really grateful for you uh, to have you back here today. We've um, been walking quite a path with Bianca and Jureen around the 101 innovations in research communication. Uh, we've learned about their work in 2015, 2016, and have subsequently used it quite a few times in the work that we do with researchers and universities across the world. So um, today we are here because of the Escalator program. Escalator, as you might know, is a program that aims to support the development of an active community of practice around digital and computational skills in the humanities and social sciences in South Africa. So hopefully what, we, what we'll achieve here is to help you grow your digital and computational skills. The Empower track um, is one of the tracks that is part of the Escalate program, and it specifically focuses on supporting women in the humanities and social sciences, because we, we know that when it comes to computational and, te and digital technologies, we are still losing women, um, and they are still less likely to take up um, the challenges around these tools and technologies. Um, so we wanted to provide a welcoming and safe space for women specifically to learn and grow together. What we want to do with this eight week, eight step program is to introduce you to the variety of tools that you can use across the research life cycle, and then help you to take a step back and think about what exactly it is that you want to learn. What is the next thing that you want to um, achieve in your research? We've had over the past few months um, so many conversations with community members and the diversity in terms of the needs, um, the skills that people already have, and the interests um, and growing their research is so diverse that we decided to create a program where everybody can decide what they want to learn and we can help you to connect to other communities that are learning the specific skills that you're looking at or also connect you to training opportunities, um, learning resources, and connect you to peers who are at the same stage of learning for the tool or technology that you're interested in. So what we're going to do, be doing today is we're going to look at the research life cycle um, and various tools and technologies that are being used and how they are being used together um, based on the research from the 101 Innovations in Scholarly Communication. And then what we want to do next after that is we're going to help you look at the research uh, tools that you are using across the research lifecycle in your own work. Um, and we're going to be doing that. I'm going to share my screen. Um, this is the first template that we've created that we'll be sharing with our community. And what we want you to do is to look at the work that Bianca and, and Jirin is going to share today and think about the work that you are doing um, in your own research and complete this table to write down what tools are you using at the moment so that you can get an overview of what's happening, where there are opportunities for you to learn, what are you already doing good, well, what skills do you have that you can share with others in the community um, and so forth. Then. After that, we'd like you to think about which tools do you want to learn more about? Really looking across the research life cycle. What did you find interesting? What have you le learned? As you join our community, as you engage in the community, you can continue to, to include new tools and technologies um, and methodologies in this list. And then you can have this available so that when there's a course coming up or when there's an opportunity to learn, you can look at your table and say, is this relevant to me now? Is this what I need to learn? Is this what I need to spend my time on? Once we've done that, we're going to, uh, we'll share another template with you. And this template is about making a plan to learn the skill that you prioritize most. So we want you to look at what can make a difference in your work in the short term, because we really want to make sure that um, our community members have a sense of achievement and accomplishment. Many times people set out to learn Python. They have never programmed before. And then the experience can be very discouraging. So what we want you to do is to um, think about what is the skill that you need now 
and make a plan to learn that in collaboration with this online learning community. So we're going to help you to decide which tool to use or to learn or which, which skill to learn uh, by asking a few questions. What skill or technology do I want to learn? Based on what you've just done, looking at your research life cycle. Why do I want to learn the skill? If we think about um, in, um, intentional learning, it's really important for you to have a clear motivation, a clear reason for wanting to learn something and um, have uh, the motivation that will pull you through when things are going tough or when you have to spend time on this and many other things. So really think about why do you want to learn a skill? Where do you want to apply the skill? So looking at your job at the moment, at your projects at the moment, or um, and where you, you're heading, do you have a place where you can apply the skill that you want to learn straight away? When will you apply this? Do you need it this year? Do you need it next year? Is there something else that you should rather learn first? Who can I learn with? And that's where the learning community comes in. We're hoping that in this community, we'll be able to connect you with peers who are at a similar learning stage or maybe a little bit more advanced or a little bit behind you so that you can share your learning experience with others. What resources do you need to learn to, to um, need to learn the skills, like course material, licensing, infrastructure? What prior knowledge do you need to learn the skills? So maybe you need to learn something else before you can learn the, the tool that you're interested in. Where can you find training or learning resources? And that's where we'll come in. We'll help you to find specifically open educational resources so that you can, can apply um, your learning in by attending courses or working through textbooks or tutorials. Um, we'll, we'll help you to define how you can learn. And then thinking about when will you learn work on this learning the skill? Um, if you don't put aside time, dedicate time to learn a new skill, then it's forever going to be haunting you. I want to learn Python, I want to learn Python, but when will you do that? So we'll share these with you. There's also a schedule. Um, and over the coming months, we'll, go, we'll be working with you and supporting you to work through this. Some people will work through this faster and do more, more technologies or tools um, over the coming months. Some people might take the rest of the year to learn one th new thing. Um, so I just wanted to share where we are heading with this with you. Um, and now I think it's a good time to, to hand it over to Bianca and Jeroen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sanelda. I, I will start. Um, and I will start by, by introducing us. We are ever so pleased to be, um, uh, to be in your session and to give you a head start with thinking about uh, tools in your, in your workflow. Um, and we, we have some activities along the way as well. So it's not only us talking. And by the way, when we are talking, it, please consider none of what we tell you as in, in any way prescriptive or as putting pressure on you. We just want to help you explore, help you consider and not piling up additional things that, that you have to do. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Jeroen Bosman from Utrecht University in the Netherlands University Library. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Bianca Kramer. Bianca, could you introduce yourself? Yep, uh, indeed, colleague from, uh, of Jeroen Bosman from Utrecht University Library. And we have been for quite a while now interested in the scholarly communication landscape, uh, the different tools and platforms available, the way people are working with those, and also how that contributes to, uh, to open science and scholarship. So we'll be sharing quite a bit of that today with you here. Yes, thank you. Um, as, as you can see on, on this opening slide, these slides are available online. So if, if you want to follow along on your own machine or uh, refer to them later on, uh, they are at tinyurl.com slash escalator workflows. Um, they will remain there and they are all CC BY licensed so you can reuse them in any way you want. So a little bit again about our background, what we have been doing over the say seven or eight uh, years uh, that have passed now. And that is really looking into scholarly communication 
at various levels. So really at the level of, of tools, but also at the level of, uh, of, of policy and scholarly communication as a whole, um, at the level of concrete practices. Um, and we have been exploring what is out there, but also doing some advocacy of what we think is, is important, what next steps that, that, we, uh, that we would like uh, uh, people, but also institutions and countries, etc., uh, to take to improve scholarly communication, to make it more open, to make it more fair. And we try to share as much of what we do openly. Um, so you, you see a few examples, uh, examples here. Much of that is on our website, 101innovations.wordpress.com, but we also share a lot of, of uh, more preliminary outcomes and, and ideas through, our, through both of our Twitter accounts. So oh, yes, so this is what we started with uh, some seven years ago, really looking at or, or being amazed also by the variety of tools out there, uh, increasingly online tools, increasingly uh, also free tools to use. Um, and we sort of started plotting them and, and seeing how many there are and, and, and what kind of functional, fun functionalities they, uh, uh, they have. And also really looking at whether they brought something new or not. Um, this, is, this is outdated by now, but the idea of really looking at tools across the workflow is something that we still explore and still think is, is important. Next one, please. But of course, um, it is not about the tools per se. If you please click next one. Um, yes, we are interested in those specific tools, in, in what they allow you to do, in, in, in who makes them, in, in, in whether they inv involve cost or learning curves, etc., and, and how they compare to each other if they, if they are sort of supporting the same functionality. But in the end, it's, it's not about the tools, it's what, it's what the tools allow you to do. And it's what the tools uh, allow you to, uh, to improve in your workflow in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of openness. And also, perhaps at a little bit higher level, in terms of how they change science, the science and, and scholarship system as a whole. Because if we all move to, to closed tools or open tools or, or specific tools, for instance, tools that, that do a lot of, lot of tracking and, and uh, are uh, harmful to your privacy, that, that has uh, consequences at a higher level as well. So not only for yourself. So that is why we will look at those various angles uh, of tools today. Next one, please. So the, the, the basic idea is to think of your work as being a workflow, as having various steps that, um, that, that, that come back in each project, project that you do. Next one, please. And the, the model we use is actually a model with seven phases. So you've got a phase of preparation, a phase of discovery, analysis, writing, publication, outreach, and assessment. And if you uh, look at those phases, of course, science is, uh, in reality, it's a fuzzy thing, and uh, you always have to, uh, to do several iterations within those phases. Uh, not, nothing, uh, nothing happens quite as you like it uh, the first time, and some, sometimes that, that, that's even built into the system, like, uh, like, like submitting to a journal, getting rejected, submitting to another journal, of having various, various rounds of peer review, but also uh, in, in your own uh, uh, analysis or writing, you might have several rounds of, uh, of the same activity to, 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 uh, to improve with every step. And also between those phases, you can go back and forth sometimes. For instance, if you, if you find you, ha you have a, a strange finding in your analysis and you go back into the literature to discover um, any, any articles, any evidence of, of, of others uh, having found the same results that, that, that might explain strange thing that, that, that you have found. Um, so um, this, is, this is complex and we realize that. Also, these, um, these phases do not always happen in this neat order. And even, even further, if you, if you look at what, what's happening, some of the activities in those phases are being shifted around. Um, um, 
also um, because of uh, technical uh, possibilities, but also because of what people like to see in, uh, in scholarly communication. For instance, you see here arrows from publication to, uh, to discovery and analysis. Um, think of people that, that increasingly share their research designs that uh, before they move on to, uh, even, even before they move on to gathering data and they publish their research designs. And of course, in the end, those research designs can be a part of their final publication, but they share it in an earlier phase. Also things like outreach that, that you can do right from the start if you want. And that is even necessary if you, if you want to do a crowdfunding for your project. You have to start by telling people, and especially people with money, um, to, to invest in your, in your project. Um, so a lot of things are moving around. And, and most of the time, that is, that is for the good. Um, but it does make things also more complex. And it, it's, um, 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 it's, it's hard to see... Uh, how, where, where this will all, all lead and, and how to, uh, how to uh, uh, make sure that you have the overview of what is happening where and where you can find what kind, kind of outputs. So, and that's because there are all kinds of different platforms for this. Um, you see those, the thi those things that have moved uh, within, this, within this circle, you see that, that there are all kinds of platforms. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not know. Um, that, that allowed it, and it's it, it's becoming a little bit more complicated because of that. But I'm hopeful that, especially with well-organized metadata um, and good search engines, that it will increasingly be possible to find all also find all those intermediary uh, outputs, like like research designs, like proposals, um, like for instance preprints, so early versions of uh, of a paper or of a chapter or a book. Um, so that should be helpful with that. Bianca, next, is, next one is for you, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, indeed. So we just discussed how this research workflow is a little bit more complicated and just a nice sequential going uh, to all these phases. Nonetheless, it still, we hope, uh, can be quite helpful also for yourself to identify all the different things that you do during research and then think about different ways perhaps of doing that. And then also about the tools and platforms, tools and platforms that support it. So that's why I want to spend a little bit more time on this research workflow and really look at the different activities that can take place within each of these phases. And for preparation, that can mean uh, defining research priorities, perhaps even crowdsourcing research priorities, so also get other opinions in, organizing a project, a team, finding collaborations, and of course, very important, getting funding and getting contracts to actually being able to carry out that research. Discovery, it can mean, of course, searching for literature, but not only literature, also looking at existing data, existing codes that you might be able to reuse or build upon, actually getting access to all that material, getting alerts and recommendations if you want to remain up to date on a certain topic uh, and have that information more delivered to you than actually actively going about finding it. Um, tools you might use for reading and viewing and annotating, also the extent to, to what that's something you do privately or you do within with your collaborators or even more public. So all of that uh, could be considered to fall under discovery. And under analysis, uh, collecting, mining, extracting data can also be extracting data from text corpus, for instance, um, and analyzing that in any way that's suitable to your own research discipline. So um, again, also very much for text analysis and, uh, and all that. So then how do you do that? Uh, to what extent uh, do you share that? Do you already share that in this phase? How do you keep track of that? What tools do you use for that? For that? analysis phase. And then the writing, that's of course writing a narrative, but it can also mean actual writing the code and how do you then write that in such a way that it's usable and shareable. Also visualization, so not just a narrative, but also more uh, using visualizations. 
uh, citing, citing uh, literature, but also citing those data and code that you might have been reusing and translating. Translating into actual different languages or translating into different for different to make things more accessible for different audiences. On the publication, um, archiving and sharing publications, both as journal articles, book chapters, but also as uh, earlier phases as preprints or working papers, archiving and sharing any of the data and codes that you uh, generated during your project, selecting a journal or publisher to actually submit to, and then, um, and then the publishing and all that comes with that, like um, considerations around uh, open access, for instance, and how to finance that. Outreach, other ways of uh, spreading the word about your research and having a conversation about your research, either before publication or after publication. So that can mean sharing posters and presentations, um, tell, tell about your research outside academia, so finding different audiences and ways to engage with those. Um, within academia, maintaining researcher profiles and networks and benefiting from those as much as possible, that could all be considered to fall under outreach. And then uh, assessments, that can be both about how you yourself assess other research, including commenting on uh, papers, doing peer review um, in, in different forms, and determining impact of that research. What do you select? What do you consider to be uh, important and valid and relevant? And um, it can also mean how your own research is assessed in that way and what are the criteria. And then both your own research and also how you are assessed as a researcher, which feeds directly again in the preparation for, for the next phase. So it is really about being assessed and also assessing yourself, what criteria you use, and also how open are those assessments made, how open is peer review, how open are commenting available. A sort of a quick uh, walkthrough through this whole research cycle, really focusing on different activities in that, in that research cycle. And um, of course, as a model, this is simplified. It might also not be complete, although we did discuss this with, uh, with a number of groups, but we're always open to suggestions of things that are actually missing from that, that you do in your own research that are not included in this one. And one thing we, do, we know that's not in here is the work you might be doing as, uh, as editor. If you are editing for a publisher or for a journal, the work that you put in there. Mostly, um, again, this might help you think about the different activities uh, that you do, the skills that you would need for that, and the tools and platforms um, you use for that. So that's why we put quite a bit of emphasis on this in the beginning. That actually leads to our first uh, activity, which is to if we invite you to take a piece of paper and draw a circle, and then put in the names of the tools and the platforms you are using. And when we say tools, that can really be uh, some software, an app or a program, an online platform or a website for any of these, um, of these research phases. And you can, if you want, really follow, follow the research cycle as we hear it here. So ordering the tools that you use around this. We'd like to give you about five minutes just for yourself on a piece of paper, draw this circle and put in some of the tools and um, tools and platforms that you use within your research. That actually ties in nicely to our next uh, slide where we start talking about efficiency of, uh, of tool usage. And Jeroen, can I hand over to you for this one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, because at, on this slide you see uh, a result from a survey we did in 2015 and 16, and we could conclude from that the number of tools that people were using in their workflow. And you see that, well, the median is, is, is just above 20, but some people use, use up to 50 or, or, or even a little bit more. Um, of course, there is no ideal number here. Um, and it might have to do with your your type of discipline or, or, or your career stage or your just 
and general attitude towards using using technology or not. Um, but twen, twen, between 20 or 15 and 20, 25 or 30 is, is sort of an average number. Next one, please. Of course, not all tools are the same. And this is, this is hypothetical, but we do see that people use different types of tools depending on what they like, whether they feel sure about, about those tools and using them, whether they feel easy about switching to something new that they will have to learn, whether they want, like to explore things. So we, in, in, in this overview, we discern between traditional, modern, innovative and experimental tools. And you, 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 you can dis discuss this, this at, at length, but those traditional ones are really the, the, the tools that existed even before things got online. And, and the modern ones are all uh, sort of born digital um, and, and are, are from, from the web age, but are really tools at scale, mostly also working for all disciplines. The innovative ones are, are tools that really add something to the, the way we work. Uh, like they quite often they are uh, uh, more working in a sort um, th that that's an old term by now uh, web 2.0 uh, uh, fashion so really allowing people to to add uh, to add content to share content to collaborate and then there are those experimental tools that really go a step further and they, they are also, and, and that's why this slide is, is, is outdated uh, by now, they are also the tools that disappear uh, the fastest because they are just an experiment uh, set up and they, they don't have the money or don't have any good business model to, uh, to remain in place. Next one, please. Of course, there are some tools that do more than just one trick. Um, these are Academia Mendeley and ResearchGate. And again, especially for, for Mendeley, there, there are some, some changes over the last few years. So Mendeley has, has been, uh, is, is now more limited that, than, than what you see here. But these are platforms that allow you to do a lot of things. And maybe any of these things, there are, for any of these things, there are other tools that do that specific thing better. Um, but if you if you use this, it, it makes some of the some of the things easy to do, and also you can profit probably from a, from a very large uh, group of people using that platform. And and for some of the things that you want to do, that that is nice because it, it may give you more examples, more feedback, and more options to uh, to collaborate or or just more eyeballs on 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 what you share. That doesn't mean um, th that we sort of particularly advocate to use these. But it's uh, it, it's nice to to explore them and, and and to see what they can offer you. Next one, please. Of course, if you look at all the tools you use, ideally they should, even if they are separate ones, so not not one tool for all of it, but even if they are separate ones, ideally they, they should uh, be able to communicate to work well together. And you see here, these are. Again, somewhat hypothetical lines, not, not, not completely uh, uh, nonsense, but, but somewhat hypothetical lines about data that, that can flow from one tool to another. Um, so if you publish somewhere, you would like, other people would like to, to get the data from that publication into their reference management system and from the reference management system into their text editor. And if you then publish and submit to a journal, you would like to not fill in all your, all your uh, details again, all those metadata and author details and, and funding details again. And if you've got that publication and you would like to, uh, like to share it and you'd like to, uh, to use it in your outreach, you also would like to easily reuse everything that, it, that, is, that is there on that publisher platform. So there are many, um, many options or, or, or many requirements uh, you, you would like to, you, you could say to, um, uh, for these tools to, to really work together and to support an efficient workflow. Next one. 
So that, that efficiency between tools, of course, is a matter of interoperability, technical interoperability of those tools. Do they read each other's data? Do they allow output formats that can be used as an input format for the, for the next tool? Also, of course, you, you, they, they have to be available, available to you within your institution uh, without cost or, or, or in a licensed way. You have to be aware of them. Um, but what's also important is that for some of these tools, they become more valuable to you if a lot of your peers, especially uh, in, in your own country or in your own field, use that tool so that you can uh, more easily collaborate, that you can more easily learn the tool together, get feedback from each other. Um, so it's not always just an individual choice. To, uh, uh, to improve that efficiency, but it's also a, man, a, a matter of uh, usage in your community. Next one. Um, but if, if, um, on the other end, it is perhaps also an individual choice. You might have some uh, individual requirements regarding those tools. Uh, because you use a certain platform or browser, certain, uh, a certain operating system or you uh, master some languages, but not others. And, and you, for, for a specific complicated tool, you would like to be the interface in, in, your, in your mother tongue. Um, or you, you don't have the money to, to buy a license or the institution doesn't have the money to buy a license or for a specific thing that you don't use uh, daily or monthly. Uh, you want it to be easy to learn because you just use it a few times and want, don't want to go through too many hoops that you don't understand. And if it is really, especially about uh, uh, data or, or sharing video or something, you, uh, you would like tools to also have a very good uh, performance and a good speed uh, of, their, um, uh, of their system. And finally, you might have in some cases specific data requirements, privacy requirements, security requirements uh, that, you, that you have set yourself or that you have to uh, um, comply with uh, because of the, the institution where you work. So this, this is a lot of requirements that, that you might have for any specific tool. Um, yeah, so the, these are all requirements that you might have also considerations in which tools to choose. And another thing, uh, another consideration here is the choice between either field specific tools and those that, or country language area specific tools. And uh, those are often also smaller tools and more larger generic tools. And that can be a choice that uh, you make for yourself. And it's interesting to then also think about uh, what might be reasons why specific tools exist next to generic one? What benefits might specific tools have? And that, that can be that they're more suited to the requirements of a specific uh, discipline in the functionality they offer, in the metadata they offer. So it might just be more uh, better suited to your own discipline. Of course, there are also drawbacks, often interoperability between um, more specific field specific tools is a bit harder than uh, with larger generic tools. Um, so it's also interesting to consider more on a system levels, uh, what are reasons why uh, smaller tools exist and what larger tools can learn from, from smaller tools. So it, in general, it's something that you can consider on your own personal level, what suits your needs best, and also more on a system level, what, what helps collaboration and what's best for science and scholarship in the long run. Is that a move towards more generic tools or is that is it also still really worthwhile to have more smaller specific tools? So we've thrown a lot of considerations uh, at you already about selecting certain tools and platforms that fit, that uh, suit your workflow and your activities best. And it's partly uh, because we think that's actually perhaps more important than to have a large overview of everything that's available, but to consider for yourself what you find important, and then look for something that fits that need. So that's why we emphasize those requirements and those uh, decision points a lot. Having said that, uh, of course, it's also important and useful to know what is out there and what you can actually uh, choose from, from what's available. And that's something that we've been working on for uh, since quite a while in uh, collecting 
all these different tools, both uh, as, a, as an, uh, a resource for researchers to see what's available, but also as a database for our own research to see how these things connect, uh, what fields there are, certain tools available and all that. So we collected all that information in our uh, 400 plus uh, tools list that you can still use and that's still available online and you're more than happy, more than welcome uh, to use. It's organized around uh, those different um, those different phases of the research cycle within these phases, uh, different activities, and then testing a number of tools uh, for that for that activity. A bit of information on uh, on what it does, on uh, the links where you can find it, when it was founded, and some more information. However, uh, this is also by now quite outdated because it's always a challenge to to maintain that, and um, so keep that keep that in mind. There are more recent tools that we don't do not yet have included in in our database and in that case it's in that sense it's also perhaps more to show the variety and the breadth of what's available than really as a pick and choose uh, list although of course you're welcome to to also look through it and use it as such we're not the only ones doing it luckily quite some other people who uh, either have been working on tools databases that sometimes also suffer from maintenance or uh, that have more recently developed tool bases, also with some different uh, focus, some different perspectives. Um, and we, we highlighted just some of these. Most of these are more up to date and might be quite useful for you. One of them is the scholarly communication technology catalog, which is really broad multidisciplinary. So you will find something for all disciplines. It also has governance info, which is also quite interesting. Is it a commercial tool? Is it from a nonprofit? How is it governed? On uh, publishing tools and services, the Radical Open Access Initiative is quite interesting because they're trying to highlight a lot of uh, publishing initiatives that go beyond the larger, more well-known uh, publishing initiatives, also with a focus on uh, more nonprofit governance. More recently, um, there's an initiative by the um, uh, Invest in Open Infrastructure um, organization to have a catalog of open infrastructure services. This is currently quite limited, but again, here they're also not just focusing on what the tool does, although of course that's part of it, but also very much on how it's governed. And before I forget, uh, first of all, we have on our own website also uh, a few more tool directories, also some specifically for the humanities, and one additional one from uh, I think uh, recent years is the um, uh, Social Science Humanities Open Cloud, which is part of the European Open Research Cloud, which so yes, it has a European focus. We'll get back to that a little bit further in the in the presentation. But what they have tried to do is also to bring about a lot of tools and services specifically for social sciences and humanities. So that might also be uh, quite interesting to, to look at. And of course, to bring this back a little bit on those requirements, we mentioned that also requirements could be that it makes it easier to collaborate with, uh, with other people. So what other people are actually using might also be a very good uh, source to get information about, about tools. And that's also that something that a group like this and a network like this that you're building right now can be really useful to really also exchange experience with each other. What do other people know? And what do, what do other people use? And how do they like it? That might also be a very nice source of, uh, of information for tools and platforms that you might not have known yet, or are perhaps a bit hesitant to start using and knowing how other people use it can be really helpful in that regard. Also, what we've seen is, again, a bit more theoretical. What we're seeing is that uh, in what tools and platforms are available, especially around, uh, around publishing also, is that you see disaggregation. That originally uh, publishing, um, you can consider traditional publishing to have a number of functions. Registration uh, of output, certification, sort of um, uh, a sanity check or really establishing validity through peer review, awareness through journals, for instance, just making people aware of research that's out there and also archiving to preserve the records. 
And what we're seeing more uh, really happening over the last years is that um, there are specific smaller tools that do one of these things really well, but don't claim to be to do all of these things. For instance, preprints are a good example. They are uh, a really nice way to get research out there early, also to, to claim precedence, to really claim that uh, you were the ones who first did this and are already putting it out there, but they're not doing peer review. And um, so that, that's really a separation. There are other tools that are specifically for open peer review that can be used in addition to, for instance, on top of preprint servers, but are not included in preprint servers. So that's again that, that disaggregation. And you can also see that in the additional roles and functions that some journals took on in selection, in uh, providing metrics, and in creating research communities. Those are all things that can be found in traditional publishing, but they can also be found more disaggregated into separate tools and, and platforms. And if you're specifically interested in one of these things, it can be really interesting to, to check that out and to check if any of that is available also outside the more traditional publishing channels. A lot of things to consider only when looking at efficiency to look at your sheet of paper and think whether these the tools that you have listed there work together well or whether there's still something to be wished for or whether you would for that reason uh, look look for other tools that, that 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 do read some of the data that comes out of a certain tool uh, and that do work more more well together um yeah, and that can also include any gaps that you uh, that you might feel you have something that you would like to be able to do and that you don't currently know what, uh, uh, what's available. So also to note that. And that again might feed very nicely into the second table that Anelda provided in the, the shared document. So we won't do that now, but that's really something we invite you to do uh, as part of this process more so than as part of this particular session. Which means that we'll also move on. And we'll move on a bit from just looking at efficiency to looking specifically at openness of uh, both of tools and platforms, but also of openness of the entire research workflow and different aspects of that. Uh, and Jeroen, can I hand over to you for the first part of this? Yeah, sure. So openness, um, there are many aspects of openness. Of course, you've got openness in the in the sense of whether a tool allows you to um, to practice uh, practice open science or open scholarship. But you can also look at the at the tools themselves, um, whether those tools themselves are open and do uh, are really part of an open infrastructure. Um, and a, a number of qu questions come into play there, like. Uh, whether a, a tool or certain platform is open source, so whether the technology behind it is is fully open and can also be understood how it works. Also, part of openness is whether a tool is non-profit or not. Um, that might also mean how much you would have to pay for it and whether the money that is put into it is also reinvested in, uh, in other open infra infrastructure. A third uh, question is whether a tool or platform uh, really only has open data and open content or whether only some of the content on, on that platform is open, but the bulk is, is more, uh, more closed and can only be accessed if you have a license. A fourth question is whether those tools are really free to use to your end. Um, um, and, and, and sometimes that, that means um, that it is entirely free to anyone. Uh, and sometimes it's free to you because your, your institution has, has licensed a certain tool. But of course, that doesn't mean that it is free to anyone. Sometimes we are, aren't even aware of, of the cost of tools because our institutions uh, uh, do supply those uh, th that access through their licenses. And the fifth qu uh, question is whether the direction of tools and whether they, uh, how they are de de further developed and, and how they are governed 
who gets to say what happens in those tools, who gets to say what happens to the data in the tool uh, and, and what kind of policies they have. Um, that is quite often, uh, quite often not clear. And it, it's, it's also a good thing to, to, to think about. For instance, if you want to be sure that uh, also in the long term, the things that you data and content that you put into a tool or platform, that you can get it out in such a way that you can uh, reshare it in another location or that you can build on it. Uh, that, that's something that, that, that is important and for which uh, the academic community might want to, to have something to say about the specific tool. Depending on which criteria you find important, it determines what tools and, and platforms actually meet those, meet those criteria. And that's also where very much um, reality hits because you might find things very important, but you might not find, you might find that they're not currently tools that meet all your requirements. So it's also very much uh, a realistic thing. But it can also be that uh, it's useful to, to look for something specifically if, if you find certain aspects uh, important and also more on a system level. If we as a community find, for instance, open source or open license data uh, important, then um, that's also something at some point that funders can start to require of platforms they fund. So this is something again for you on a personal level, but also more on a on a systems level. So again, more perhaps more on a on a system level. Why would um, and perhaps together uh, we could call this uh, open infrastructure? And again, not being said that something is only open infrastructure if all these things uh, are met but they're all components of uh, of open infrastructure and making things uh, more open both making the tools themselves more open but also the data we've um, uh, resulting from those that can help in enabling collaboration and uh, and reuse at level of the data if you can actually uh, reuse those data to check reproducibility um, it can support researchers moving between institutions. If you use a proprietary tool that's itself closed, then um, it might be harder to, to take that, uh, to, to use that when you're outside of your institution. It also makes it harder to collaborate with people in different institutions who don't have access to the, to the same tool. Um, open infrastructure might prevent vendor login both the lock-in of data, that's really if the data are enclosed in the platform and cannot be taken out of that, then you as an institution are almost obliged to keep paying for that same tool. Um, so really open infrastructure might make it easier. Another aspect of open infrastructure that we didn't discuss so much, but also very important for sustainability, if is there an exit plan? Is there an insurance? What happens if a tool cannot be sustained any longer? That might be a risk. And is, that, is there any contingency plan? What happens with the data generated by a tool if that's in that tool, if the tool goes bankrupt? Is that then lost or will it be able to be available, will it be portable and can you use it in another tool? Especially for open source tools, it can also uh, support community-based development and, uh, and innovations. A lot of the tools also that are currently in use were really started by researchers themselves. And uh, if they do that in an open source way, then one way to build it out and to make it sustainable is to get more people involved in that development. And with that on a system level, it might contribute to a common infrastructure that's independent of big commercial players and, um, and available to, to everyone. Again, these are all quite lofty uh, goals and um, reality might be different at the moment. And there are also other goals and desires. We've talked a lot about efficiency in the first part and um, tools that are currently fully open on many or all of these five criteria might not give you currently the functionality that you might need in terms of efficiency, for instance even apart from uh, considerations on whether everything should be open. There are, of course, very valid reasons why data, for instance, should not be open. And then a tool might also be, it might be very good practice of a tool to enable closed, uh, closed data. So it's also a consideration for yourself in deciding what to use. 
to what ex how does openness those different aspects of openness how do they weigh against other goals and desires and the lock in we mentioned that a little bit um what we are what we are seeing increasingly over the last years and that might be quite familiar to you is um parties often big commercial parties but not all of them but providers of tools and platforms to try to offer a suite of tools that really uh, that has something for the whole research cycle meaning that you can stay within the ecosystem of a certain provider and do a lot of things throughout the research cycle and uh, perhaps one of the most um, obvious examples of that and also the most infamous example but definitely not the only one uh, could be considered uh, Elsevier, where we've really seen that consolidation and thus acquire, uh, Elsevier acquiring tools and platforms uh, and incorporating them in their own uh, their own suites, making Elsevier currently uh, not just a pusher, but really a company that uh, offers a lot more functionalities. And in doing that, there are certain efficiency gains because. It's easy if, uh, for instance, your university subscribes, gives you access to a lot of these tools. If they interoper interoperate well, that is good for efficiency, but there are also downsides to that. Downsides that uh, you're bound to that specific, uh, that specific provider. And it's a lot harder to walk away from that if that specific provider provides a lot of tools throughout the research cycle that researchers uh, depend on. And also, um, interoperability also means that there's a lot of data flow <coughs> going between uh, between those tools and a lot of data generated by researchers using that tool and that's very beneficial to to Elsevier itself because that data is um, is good for them to know what they can market and what they can do but it's also in itself a valuable commodity that they can um, they can then uh, profit from so there are really reasons to be perhaps quite wary about this uh, consolidation of, uh, of tools. At the same time, there are also examples of really open providers, uh, open science framework, for instance, that also tries to offer, tries to offer services uh, across the research cycle. So it's not so much to me whether a provider tries to be um, to offer tools to our research cycle, but more what it means how, uh, for the openness and what it means for the dependency that's created in there. Can you actually, are you really free to also use other tools and platforms for the same functionality or are you really bound into that, uh, to that golden cage? And of course, uh, the fact, and this again ties back into the sustainability, the fact that uh, smaller tools and platforms are often bought by big players and that can be seen as a success for a small uh, platform that might not have been able to sustain itself as a small platform, but the fact that something is being bought up by a big player is no guarantee for sustainability and for continued availability, uh, because uh, quite often something uh, like this is still sunsetted after it has been acquired. And Hardbench, which is an electronic lab notebook, is one example uh, of that in the whole Elsevier suite. We do keep track of these workflows and uh, they're also in need of updating that we're actually currently working on and they're available also on our website. So in the end, it, it's your own choice. You, you can make a lot, of, a lot of choices regarding specific tools or combination of tools. And you, you can be very principled in that, but it's always go good at, at, at some point to also be, be selfish and just choose that tool that, that, that really suits your, your current needs or, or things that you would like to achieve within a certain time frame or just for your career. But it's good to, to, to look, at, look at your sheet of paper and think about whether those tools really make it possible for you to, uh, to practice open scholarship uh, to the extent that you want to, and whether those tools themselves uh, uh, do comply with these openness criteria, if you think that that, that is an important criteria. Next one, please. Um, of course, uh, this is all part of a, of a longer term transformation of scholarly communication. Um, it, it, and, and to a certain extent, that is the result of individual choices, but it's also the result of things that uh, institutions, their federations and governments, and even 
uh, uh, supranational organizations um, uh, would like to see happening. Next one, please. Um, if, if you look at, at what, what is happening in this, in this space, there are many organizations that, that, have, set, that have set goals uh, for scholarly communication to become more open, to become more fair, um, and really to support open scholarship. And you can see these range from very concrete things that, that, that focus on, on just one thing that should be improved. It might be a technical thing like, like, like data citation principles uh, to very broad recommendations like the recent one from, from late last year, uh, the UNESCO uh, re recommendation on open science, which really strives to, to set a sort of standard for open science and scholarship across the world. And that, that, and that was uh, signed by each and every government. Uh, uh, on our globe. Next one, please. And uh, you could skip that one. Um, I also won't go into the details of, of this one. We could have a, a discussion at some other point really into the details of vendor lock-in. It is, it is quite, uh, quite a complex uh, discussion, but it is important, especially if in a, in a country or an institution really is going to spend millions for, for many years for, into a big contract, then it, it, it's a good moment to really, really think uh, what that contract means for uh, for your ties to that specific supplier. Yeah, and then another consideration, um, more also on the system level, is what does the availability of tools and platforms, the role of the of the of providers in that, and also the users, what does it say about what does it mean for more global equity? Because yes, most of the tools and the platforms we've sort of used as examples so far are all either European or North American based. And that's in itself a problem. And uh, I refer here to quite a bit of the work of uh, Joe Havenman and Louise Bezardehout, who have been looking at that more into detail. And again, uh, when looking at criteria um, for, for tools and platforms, also very specifically look at underlying values, as for, perhaps also um, reflected in in business models, financial models, also language choices, uh, what language choices do, uh, do tools come into and are there also tools that are really specific for really encourage multilingualism, uh, geographical location, uh, what tools are available outside of, uh, of the global north and specifically also developed by, um, by uh, by players organizations uh, within Africa, within Latin America, within within Asia, um, that might be better suited or very much more suited for also use uh, by people. Also, to what extent do tools support user communities and really encourage uh, community in that sense? So those are also additional ways in which you can look at tools. And something that, uh, that they've also been doing is looking at, for instance, in this case, availability of digital research repositories within Africa. So what are local uh, repositories? And then also look uh, a bit more closer, uh, for instance, what platforms do, uh, are used for these repositories to run on. And here's a breakdown of those repositories. They identified um, by country. So what's available really on the African continent uh, from within Africa? There's a lot that can, uh, that can be said about that. Um, and one thing I didn't put up here, but for instance, with Afri Archive, um, a preprint platform specifically for African research that also um, allows and stimulates multilingualism and uh, translation. And it also tries to, tries to connect to other um, other services and platform in the research workflow that are really from Africa itself. So really sort of trying to break away from a dominance of uh, more European and North American uh, platforms and tools to use. Yeah, sure. Just uh, uh, sort of working towards our, our wrap up. Of course, in the end, especially in this in this uh, series of meetings that you're having right now, it is also for you very uh, a concrete question: which tool do I want to use for what? And in that, it, it's it's interesting to compare sets of tools. And here I've made some examples. 
and uh, in, in all cases put on the left sort of the traditional more close tool. Also quite often a more uh, well-known one because it's quite often that the more open alternatives have less say marketing power to, uh, to, um, uh, pr to promote their brand and their product. So you could compare for each type of functionality, you could compare the, the tool list, listed on the left uh, with, the, with the ones on the right. Um, like, like, like for searching, do you use Web, web of Science or, or, or Scopus, expensive closed tools, or do you use uh, uh, Lens or, or, of course, Google Scholar uh, or Base? And so you have this for almost every type of functionality. You can compare RefWorks with Sotero or on the next slide, please. Uh, compare Mendeley data from Elsevier with Sonodo or compare SSRN again from Elsevier with uh, uh, OSF preprints if you want to share a preprint on a general or generic preprint server or if you want to reach out with your own research research profile uh, with, with information about about yourself and your publications you can compare a very a sort of closed commercial uh, system like ResearchGate with ORCID, they, they, they do not compare an, an, uh, exactly because they, they, they have their own strengths and, and weaknesses, but it's good to, to, in all these cases, to consider the, the various alternatives. Next one, please. And um, also, this is just a, a final reminder that there are a few very broad um, uh, organizations that are very much open, often grassroots and, and working, working in a quite principled way, uh, like Creative Commons for licenses, like Wikimedia, actually for, for anything that in, uh, in uh, scholarly communication, they are well known because of Wikipedia, but they have quite a lot of other initiatives that very well, well support uh, science and scholarship. And the Internet Archive for all content, digital content, and, and sustainably archiving that. This might also really fit into the next phases of the uh, of the program to to share thoughts on on any of these aspects we discuss and what it means for your own workflow and what you would like to uh, to achieve. And indeed, it, it's it's good to to talk about talk a lot about that in also in in, in small groups if you have that opportunity. We hope to uh, to have given you. Uh, an overview of considerations when when designing your workflow or making adapt adaptations to your workflow or when thinking about some tool that 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 you want to want to promote or want to ask for within your institution um, and we hope this is very helpful to you and we will remain uh, open to, to questions during during the next week so uh, please reach out to us if you have uh, specific uh, uh, specific questions and we will uh, keep working on, on updating the, uh, the databases of tools as far as possible, because this is a very uh, dynamic environment. Thank you so much, Jeroen Bianca. This was absolutely phenomenal. I really, I can't believe how well you planned the, the um, content of this to fit with what the rest of the program. So I really appreciate the work that you've put in and the thought that you've put in. Um, definitely, I think some of the activities that you've shared we can use in our upcoming co-working session for people who are going to have to leave shortly. Please remember to sign up for our co-working session that takes place on the 26th of May um, at, in the same time slot. I have updated the um, Eventbrite documentation now, so you will be able to access the Zoom link from the Eventbrite um, calendar uh, activity. And um, we can we can look through some of these activities specifically. I think the last one that you showed was very very relevant. And then we will also share the templates over the coming weeks, um, so that you can start looking at that and start identifying what your learning journey looks like, what you want to learn, how you're going to learn it, and what you need from us and how we can support you. So thank you very much um, again to Jeroen and, and Bianca. I think the talk was. Spot on. Thanks a lot. It, it, it was really our pleasure. One, one final, very minor remark. If you go through the slides, because we, we, we went through them very quickly. If you, if you go back to the slides, we should have said this in the beginning. Please, please uh, uh, know that e almost each and every image in that slide is clickable. So that, that will take you immediately to any tools or, or background information. So you can click on anything in the slides.
Wonderful. So we'll definitely take that as a starting point for our first co-working session and we'll get back to you if there's any additional questions or comments. And also from me, thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity and also best of luck in the program because I think it's a fantastic program and really nice initiative to, to set us up with these eight steps. So hope that's, uh, that's productive. <laughs>